Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way, others were made that way by men, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of God. The one who can accept this should accept it. Let's pray. Again, Father, we come before you this morning as your children to bow in your presence, aware of your greatness, your majesty, your power, thanking you for what you've done in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. And together we come and ask this morning, as we ask every day, that we will live this day before you, honouring you in thought, word and deed. And we pray now, as we look at your word, that you'd help us to understand some of these difficult and, in some people's minds, controversial passages, and shed your Holy Spirit, his light, into your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well today we're going to look at a major enemy of marriage and a major failure in marriage. The major enemy is adultery and the major failure is called divorce. Now it could be argued that adultery is prohibited by no less than three of the Ten Commandments. If you think about it, the Seventh Commandment says you shall not commit adultery. The next commandment, the eighth, says you shall not steal. And the tenth and final commandment says you shall not covet your neighbour's wife. Recently I was on a long haul flight um, and I was watching a movie, I I forget the title, and it was about a, a developing relationship between a man and a woman, both of whom worked in the same office. It was the classic scenario. He was the boss and she was his secretary and as they fell in love, their romance, you could see developing. It was a charming story. It was sensitively portrayed and it was well acted. Then I discovered something that changed the whole perspective because the scene then shifted to the house where the man lived and where we learned that he was already married with a wife and two young children who were apparently quite ignorant of what was taking place just down the road in the office. And I would hazard a guess that many people today, certainly in the West, wouldn't consider an extramarital affair like the one in the film particularly wrong. Uh, They would just call it a fling. But God clearly does consider it wrong. He calls it adultery. And it's actually the most serious violation of marriage. And in the Old Testament, it is considered second only to idolatry in terms of wickedness. In fact, adultery, the word adultery, covers uh, all different ways that infidelity, that's lack of faithfulness, can take place in a marriage. And yet there are those in society who, in contradiction to God's law, actively promote adultery. In his book, The Affair, and this was now published, I think, 40 years ago, Morton Hunt wrote this. It may be that many of those who do remain faithful to a single partner throughout life pay dearly in frustration and resentment of their mates. He continues, Adultery seems better suited to the emotional needs of many people particularly men, 
It offers renewal, excitement and the continuance of experiences of personal rediscovery. It is an answer to the boredom of lifelong monogamy. And then he says, we are by nature polygamous. So this man clearly elevates and encourages adulterous behaviour. And of course adultery or examples of adultery among famous people are numerous. We've almost come to expect it, haven't we, of any Hollywood actor or actress. Don't know if you remember, but in the course of the now famous or infamous interview that the late English princess Diana gave on the BBC to Martin Bashir, in that interview she admitted adultery. However, her then husband, Prince Charles, was simultaneously guilty of adultery with a woman, Camilla Parker Bowles, who as you now know is his second wife. And while I was a school teacher, and some of you know I taught for over 20 years, I always remember a, a fellow member of staff, he left his wife and tragically the two kids, both of whom had been adopted, uh, to start a new relationship with a younger woman. I remember him saying to me on one occasion that this new relationship, quote, just felt so right. And so we find today that personal contentment before personal commitment seems to be the ethos of the age for many. But the Christian would argue that what is right is not a matter of personal subjective feelings but of God's revealed truth which clearly says you shall not commit adultery you shall not cover your neighbour's wife all of God's laws <coughs> including those built around the gift of sexuality <coughs> are designed for our own good and although sexual sin is, is no worse or it's no more serious than any other sin it has to be said that the repercussions of it can be widespread and none more so than when a Christian leader is involved. My friend uh, Phil who was married with one daughter I actually taught his daughter, his only child um, was a lecturer in New Testament Greek at a Bible school he was a successful past pastor of a multi-ethnic church then very unwisely he had an affair with a woman in his church who became pregnant. He ultimately left his home, his ministry, his church and his family to marry the woman. And in that process he destroyed of course his family and with particularly serious effects on the life of his only child. The church he pastored then divided and his testimony in the neighbourhood was really finished. He himself took a new job as a baggage handler at London Airport. And just one example of the devastating and tragic results of adultery. And I, I realise as I'm talking about this this morning that some of you might have been either involved in or on the receiving end of this sort of behaviour. And uh, therefore I approach this subject with, as with all these subjects on Christian ethics, with some trepidation and also asking that God would give grace it must be remembered that the Bible tells us that any violations of one another are ultimately violations of God himself when tempted by Potiphar's wife to commit adultery Joseph testified with these words how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God and then after committing adultery with Bathsheba and arranging the murder of her holy innocent husband Uriah David, King David declared against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight and then speaking to the nation of Israel in the book of Amos the Lord denounced their behaviour saying father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name so all sin ultimately is primarily and firstly against God but almost always other people tragically get caught up in it too. But before we all rise or most of us rise to proclaim our innocence and claim we are not guilty when it comes to the sin of adultery 
it is important to recall that Jesus looked beyond the act to the source of sexual immorality, the heart. And in Matthew 5 verse 28 he said, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So on that basis, how many of us can declare ourselves completely innocent? Today we are being bombarded as never before with the subject of sex. Sex is inescapable. Pick up a newspaper, turn on the television, which you're spared here, listen to the radio, and we seem to be slowly sinking beneath a flood of sexual propaganda. Again, I'm speaking from a Western perspective. You can contextualise it to wherever you come from. There's talk about sex, advice about sex, questionnaires about sex, images of sex and problems with sex. It's used to sell ice cream, cars, deodorants, holidays, classical music and would you believe it, even pet food. Steve Wright, who's a disc jockey, a DJ on BBC, uh, BBC's Radio 2, said this, he said, not only have millions typed SEX, sex, into Google, but more than 50% of men who use the internet have accessed pornographic sites at some time. And it's clear that one of the biggest problems facing perhaps men in particular today is internet pornography and Christian men are not immune from this. Sadly, this addiction, which is what it really is, is making serious inroads into the lives of many individuals. And equally worryingly, like all addictions, it craves an increasingly stronger dose each time to give some sort of satisfaction. I've got a friend in England, doesn't live far from me, he's a pastor, and he has huge problems with internet pornography. I know that because he's told me. And in doing that, already 50% of the battle has been won, not the whole battle. And so we've been through all this, first of all taking the computer out of the bedroom, down into the main lounge, so everybody can see uh, what he's looking at. And um, through prayer and through accountability, uh, progress is being made. But it is, believe me, a huge problem. George Verwer, who, what, he's 71, 72 now, grandfather, of course visits many countries and often stays in hotels. And the first thing he does when he goes into a hotel bedroom is he unplugs the television set. Now, if anybody needed to see what was going on in the world with teams in over a hundred countries, surely he does. But he knows his heart. He remembers that before he came to Christ, he used to sell pornography, one of the things he was into. And he doesn't want to be led down that path again through temptations from the evil one. It's all about knowing your heart, really, isn't it? And taking the right precautions. We've more sexual crimes than ever before and the high-tech pornography business makes more money than the entire automobile industry every year. Sexual freedom has promised much, but seems to have delivered very little other than hang-ups, problems and disappointments. Therefore, it is somewhat disappointing to find that the church in the West has not only had minimal impact in this area, but is sadly sometimes itself found to be morally compromised. 100 years ago, approximately, in the UK, the vast majority in society observed the law of God, honoured marriage and despised adultery. Generally speaking, this is generalisation, self-discipline was taught and practised in the area of sexual relationships. Living together, what was that? Well, that was what? a husband and a wife did and to be illegitimate or a bastard was considered a terrible social stigma but then discipline came to be associated with negative behaviour it was equated with words like repression which psychologists told us was physically and mentally harmful we were told if 
if you want to do something, if your body is urging you on a particular course of sexual activity, go ahead. There's nothing wrong, as long as no one gets hurt. Few realize that the psychologists, or some psychologists and psychiatrists, were using the wrong word. Yes, repression is bad, but that's not what the Bible says we are to do. The Bible speaks of suppression, which is something very different. That means control, restraint, obedience, um, self-discipline, for the good of all and for our own personal positive development. Writing to the church at Thessalonica, Paul said, Each one of you should learn to control his body in a way that is holy and honourable. I noticed that all the girl guides in the United Kingdom are now being issued with packs entitled New Reality. And in one section of this little booklet that deals with sexual relationships, it says this, quote, What you consider to be an inappropriate relationship may not be inappropriate to others. And few seem to have recognised the terrible consequences of this sexual abandonment when God and the truth of his word have been completely removed from the equation. But these arguments, they're not new. They're not some revolutionary Christian ideas that are jumping out in the middle of the 21st century. They're found right back in the first century at the very birth of the church. And there's one virtue I challenge you to find anywhere in today's media, and that's modesty. Do you remember her? Almost completely forgotten and abandoned. Dictionary definition of modesty is self-control, chastity of thought, speech and behaviour. William Barclay wrote that chastity was the one completely new virtue which Christianity brought into the world. In the ancient world, the sexual appetite was regarded as a thing to be gratified, not a thing to be controlled. And if you want to learn what Christianity was like in the few centuries after the resurrection of Christ, read some of the letters from the early church fathers. I encourage you, you know, have a look on the internet at some of the letters that were written in the second, third century. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Here's, here's one I found. This is um, a guy called Diognetus in the second century. And as far as I understand it, he's writing a letter to a non-Christian or non-Christians to explain to him or them or her what Christians, not so much what they believe, but how they practice their faith. And uh, this is what he wrote. He said this, Christians marry and have children, but they don't kill unwanted babies. They are persecuted by all, and yet they love everyone. They share their table with everybody, but they don't share their bed with everybody. That could have come straight out 21st century, but it was actually written way back in the days of the early church or soon after the early church was born. Well today divorce in the church seems to be increasingly common. 25 years ago in the USA only half of all marriages were first marriages for both partners and in a quarter of the marriages both partners were marrying for a second time. The reason I'm quoting statistics from the United States is simply because they're far better at giving us statistics. Uh, whereas in the UK sometimes it's quite hard to come by some statistics so that's why often we quote them over 50% of second marriages in the United States and in the UK end in divorce <clears throat> and the figures rise to two thirds where both partners have married for the second time why are these figures so high? well in an article entitled Is Remarriage Adultery? Kevin Boyce whose name you might recognise, wrote in 1999, Divorcees can falsely assume that things will go well in the next marriage because they think the last marriage failed because of the other partner. This is far from the truth. Second marriages are statistically 
less successful because the majority of people who can make a good marriage work are still in their first one. <laughs> Today, the divorce rate in the American church is at times even higher than in the culture, fueled, no doubt, by certain books that promote divorce. Here's a quote from one book, and again, this was published 30 years ago. The book's entitled, Divorce, How and When to Let Go. Quote, Yes, your marriage can wear out. People change their values and their lifestyles. People want to experience new things. Change is a part of life. Letting go of your marriage, if it is no longer good for you, can be the most successful thing you've ever done. Getting a divorce can be a positive, problem-solving, growth-oriented step. It can be a personal triumph. Well, the dominant worldview expressed here, if you haven't picked it up, is one of selfish individualism, while the Christian view of marriage as a lifelong commitment is now, I would imagine, a minority view in the West. The view in the West is that choice is preferred to commitment. I like what one writer said, speaking of marriage, he said, those of us who are lucky enough to have good marriages know that it has very little to do with luck. Well, the consequence of this general loss of discipline in society is fairly predictable. Shouldn't surprise anyone. My last year of teaching, full-time teaching in an elementary school, was 1992. And that year, or maybe it was the previous year, I had a number of teenage girls come to visit me. I'd only taught them a few years earlier, and they were coming back to visit their former primary school teacher, or teachers, not just me, but others in the school, each of them proudly holding a baby in her arms. They wanted to show me the latest addition to their life, and they wanted me to rejoice with them. I have to say, my heart broke as I thought of the future of these fatherless children being brought up by those who were still very much children themselves. Is it little wonder then that the UK has the highest divorce rate in the European Union with the highest number of teenage pregnancies? See, the consequences for a society that abandons biblical truth are very serious because with the truth you will always lose discipline. Marriage is a divine institution which in itself should not be affected by the changing culture. Christ clearly taught that God's original purpose was permanence in marriage. Quoting Jesus in Matthew 19, the marriage service says, What God has joined together, let no one separate. Or the old version says, let no man put asunder. And indeed, for the first five centuries after Christ, the early church regarded marriage, remarriage, after divorce, as contrary to Christ's teachings. In Matthew 5, verse 32, we read Jesus said, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. So we find then there is one and only one ground given for divorce, adultery or fornication. Fornication is a broad term referring to all kinds of sexual sin, including incest, adultery, premarital sex and homosexual relations. In other words, when one party in the marriage cheats sexually, the other partner does not commit the sin of adultery if, following divorce, he or she remarries. However, apart from this one exception of marital unfaithfulness, Jesus called remarriage after divorce adultery. If you'd like to turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll read something that the Apostle Paul said. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 10 to 13, okay? 1 Corinthians 7, 
verses 10 to 13. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and her husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. And then going on to verse uh, 15, But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So basically here Paul repeats the general principle laid down by Christ no divorce so if a partner does decide to leave and Paul doesn't specify the reason for leaving by the way he's only two options remain unmarried or be reconciled to his mate now it's also important to not forget the context this was written in it's written to the Corinthian believers the Corinthian church had many who'd come from a background of rampant immorality before becoming Christians and joining the church and I would imagine this was still a, probably a major problem in the fellowship rather than allow many what they call quickie divorces today for those who were struggling with difficult marriages Paul chose not to give that easy get out preferring no doubt to later engage in some pastoral ministry in verses 10 to 11 we read a wife must not separate from her husband but if she does she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and a husband must not divorce his wife so it's therefore also clear that Paul did realize that some marriages even between committed Christians would reach a position of what we would call being on the rocks then Paul deals with the problem of the unconverted mate who wants to leave. In verse 15 he says, But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. The apostle says, let him go free. Well, many in Protestant churches believe that this permanent desertion is grounds for legitimate divorce and possible remarriage but there are equally many who do not see this as a second exception for remarriage it depends how you interpret the term is not bound some say it's a technical term for divorce while others say that the freedom given is simply freedom to remain single and not to feel guilty for failing to hold on to the departing mate so the option then seems to be to separate and remain single or effect a reconciliation after a period of time has elapsed. I think we have to realise also that there are situations that are far from straightforward. What of believers who separate and divorce other than on grounds of either adultery or a permanent desertion? And then they want to marry again. Is that a sin? Could it even be described as polygamy? For the person is marrying again when it could be said they are still married and therefore end up with more than one spouse. I think you probably realise this is one of the hottest and most difficult issues leaders in the church are wrestling with today. I think of a friend of mine, a committed Christian, who was not sure what to do in a situation where a, a divorce was going to happen between him and his wife it did actually happen and he, he went through a tumultuous time searching the scriptures trying to find out what the right thing was to do David Pryor in facing this question says is he or she bound or enslaved to living as a divorced person with no prospect of remarriage that's the question over which Christians of every persuasion will probably have to agree 
to disagree. The one consideration which above all others prevents the whole discussion from degenerating into ivory tower theological ethics is the real possibility that Paul is actually writing out of the trauma of his own experience. If one does commit the sin of adultery, I, I'm talking about in terms of a non-biblical remarriage, and truly repents, we have to say on the authority of God's word that God will forgive him or her and that the people of God should also forgive him or her as well. What about the difference, you might be asking, between the divorce before someone is converted or divorce after the person is converted? Well, Robert St. McQuilkin argues that the distinct distinction is not tenable. He maintains it's the same as with other ethical issues, since biblical principles apply equally to Christian and non-Christian alike. In other words, they apply before conversion as well as afterwards. However, actually, when you read the New Testament, it poses great problems to the age in which we live where divorce and remarriage are commonplace. In fact, increasingly common. The church has the very difficult task of preaching on one hand the permanency of marriage and on the other hand showing the forgiveness of sins to those whose marriages have failed. Moving from what the Bible teaches to pastoral problems caused by failed marriages is not easy. You ask any pastor or marriage counsellor about that. Modern British law which allows divorce on trivial grounds within a year of marriage is clearly contrary to biblical teaching. Forty years ago, the Church of England recommended an alternative and more flexible approach when looking into the possible grounds for divorce. They came up with the concept of, quote, irretrievable breakdown of marriage. One minister declared that some marriages die even while both married partners are still alive. But while irretrievable breakdown attempts to be helpful, it's not scriptural. It seems to suggest that marriages break down by themselves and it views marriage as really being more about self-fulfilment. And that's a very 21st century postmodern secular outlook guaranteed to make divorce easier. In fact, it opens the door to divorce on demand and leaves no room for either the grace of God or the gospel of reconciliation. You probably know in Islam to divorce, all the husband has to say to the wife three times is, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Then it's finished. Now, you're even allowed in Islam to send the message three times by text. David Atkinson says, Divorce expresses sin as well as tragedy. It's not so much about issues of irretrievable breakdown as matters of moral responsibility. People say that a marriage failed, but isn't that a cover for the truth? The marriage is presented as being the problem because the individual can do no wrong. Well, after 28 years of marriage and producing seven children, Mel Gibson and his wife announced four weeks ago that they are divorcing, citing, quote, irreconcilable differences. But they've been married for more than half of their lives. Now there's even what is called a no-fault divorce. I think Robertson McQuilkin sums it all up. He said, my conviction is that 90% of the problems in marriage result directly from sin and that obedience to the plain teaching of Scripture would of itself, in most cases, produce the kind of marriage God intends. Writing on this subject, Bill and Lynn Hybels have injected another bit of reality when they declared, living intimately with another human being is the greatest challenge in the world. Well, the pastoral and ethical issues are immense, they are important, and I think those who lead marriage courses need to clearly explain the issues of commitment and reconciliation in marriage and so help prevent this present hemorrhaging of marriage relationships that 
seems to be happening all around us today. I was talking with some friends from India. India, a country which has been known for real stability in marriage and they're beginning to see their increasingly marriage breakdown which is something relatively new to the society in that country. Even some Christian ministers manage to divorce and remarry while retaining their leadership roles. John Stott said this, he says, he refuses to talk with a couple about divorce until he's first talked with them about what you mean by marriage. Well, on a hot July day, almost 12 years ago, I stood in a church and was asked a question by a minister in front of, I think, about 300 people. What was the question the minister asked me? Did he say to me, do you fancy her? Did he say, is there chemistry between the two of you? Did he say, is she a nice shape? Or did he say, is there an intellectual compatibility? Are you on the same wavelength? Do you like talking for a long time? Did he ask that question? Now he said this, Gareth, will you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Will you love her, comfort her, honour and keep her, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep her only to yourself as long as you both shall live? And the answer? I will. In other words, it was the will that was being addressed. And marriage is fundamentally an act of the will. It's turning your back, really, on your single life. It was remarkably similar, actually, to a vow I made many years earlier when I publicly turned my back on my old sinful life and said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, I will take you, Jesus, to myself as my saviour for the rest of my days. These are awesome, serious promises. They're not primarily about your emotions or even about your intellect. We're talking about an act of the will. And as in our commitment to God, so it is in our commitment to our spouse. Both are commitments for life, they are made before God, both are acts of the will, and I can tell you it's the will alone that will hold you through some of the storms of life, the storms of marriage, whether they're financial problems, physical or even mental problems, miscommunications and difficulties of every kind. At the end of the day, it's that decision that you made before God that will keep you on track. And in both commitments, there will of course be times of failure. It's then that it's good to know that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know how many of you have heard of a Bible writer called B.B. Warfield. Does that ring any bells? Benjamin Breckenbridge Warfield, great Bible commentator. Great theologian. He lived over a hundred years ago. If you look at Bible commentaries, you'll see some B.B. Warfields somewhere there. But those who knew him marveled at something even more remarkable than his scholarship. Do you know what happened to B.B. Warfield? On his honeymoon, his wife was struck by lightning. They were riding horses together and from that moment onwards on the honeymoon she was bedridden the rest of her life. And in fact, she needed almost total care. He was never away from her for more, I think, than one hour from that moment onwards till the end of her days. And he's remembered by us as a great teacher. He was remembered in those days as a great carer, a man who lived out the commitment that he had made. Remember the name, B.B. Warfield. Psychologically and financially, the trauma of divorce, they say, is even worse than bereavement. The divorcee will need all the support and all the encouragement the Christian community can provide. And they need complete assurance that God has forgiven them even when they cannot forgive themselves. And the church should always bear witness to the love and forgiveness that is in Christ especially to those who are most conscious of their need of it. The same God who said, I hate divorce in Malachi, said in Hosea, I will heal their waywardness and I will love them 
freely. And finally, shortly after his son had married, and he himself was leaving by ship, William Carey, the father of modern missions, wrote these words to his son. His son who just got married. He said, Esteem her highly that she may highly esteem you. The first impression of love arising from form or beauty will soon wear off. But the trust arising from character will endure and increase. I hope that as soon as you are settled in your cabin, you will begin and end each day together in prayer and praise to God. And two quotes. One from a very famous writer called Anonymous. He said this. Maybe she said this. <clears throat> the key to a healthy marriage is to keep your eyes wide open before you get married and half closed afterwards. And then a guy called Mignon McLaughlin said a successful marriage requires falling in love many times always with the same person. No easy answers but the grace of God always there to support to encourage to help and of course brothers and sisters too that we can pray with and share with. So let's pray. Lord we know there are those on this ship who have been affected by divorce and by adultery and we thank you Lord this morning we can come to you as one who brings healing and forgiveness thank you so much that we can know the grace that can give us strength to face life with its difficulties its challenges and even today Lord we don't know what we face but we know we can face them with the Saviour of the world in our hearts Help us, we pray, to glorify your name. Amen. Have a good day. Good morning. Could you help us to stack the chairs seven high and bring them to the port lounge? Thank you very much. <laughs>